Well, as you just heard, Jesus was walking along that Sea of Galilee, and he encounters Simon, but he's Peter, and Andrew. He says, I have a better job for you. I will send you out, and you will, you will fish for people. And they leave their nets and their boat behind, and they just, they follow. And so, I've asked this question before, but I want to ask it again. How in the world and when did it happen that Peter changed from a Jewish fisherman into a Christian? At what point did this happen? And I think it's more than just an idle curiosity, but if we truly are a life on mission... If, if the goal really is so much more than simply to fill these empty seats with people, but it is of a change of heart, of an allegiance, of a love, of a king, of a leader, from whatever it was in a person to now singularly Jesus. I think this is a pretty important passage and understanding to have. How does someone actually and when do they become a Christian? As we look at the life of Peter, was, was it that moment, you know, that he, he left the net behind? It would take faith in Jesus to leave your, you know, the safety of all that you've had and worked for. Maybe that, that was a moment, but I would imagine it was more of just potential of what Jesus, I mean, he hadn't done anything, right? He just said, come follow me. Maybe they were just bored Maybe they were broke. Who knows? Maybe this is just a better thing to do, more exciting. Who knows? So, maybe it was when Jesus did his first miracle. You know, they're at that wedding, and that's just where I've come. That's why I got my flower on. The wine is flowing, and then it dries up. Jesus, can you help us? Oh, great. My first miracle. Everyone's going to say... Ah, oh, I'm a drunkard, I know this. Okay, sure, all right. Get the stone jars, and they're about this high, you know. Okay, fill them with water. And when his disciples saw this, they said, Yes, I will follow this man. Okay, I believe Jesus. And maybe that was the moment. Although, when it comes to miracles, that, I don't know, that's kind of a, more of a parlor trick, really, you know, not a big miracle. So maybe it was the time, you know, that, that Peter himself gets, gets himself all worked up and he, he sees out on the, on the water Jesus walking and everybody's screaming, who is it? It's a ghost. And, and Jesus, oh, it's me. And, and Peter, oh yeah, there's something inside of this man. And could it be faith in Jesus? You know, well, tell me to get out of the boat. And, and, G, and he's walking on the water. The text actually says he walked to Jesus. That would take some faith in him, right? Okay, is that the moment? Or, or maybe, maybe it's Confirmation Sunday. Did you know he had one, Peter? Yeah. Jesus was quizzing him, you know, like, well, who do people say I am? And Peter, he stands up, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, you pass confirmation. All right. <laughs> maybe it was Transfiguration Sunday, you know, the Peter, James, and John up with Jesus, and, and there on the mountain, Jesus shows in all of his glory and Peter doesn't know what to say. He doesn't have the right words. It's just, I want to stay here. This is awesome. Maybe it was Easter Sunday, you know, when he actually sees the resurrected body of Jesus. What place would doubt have in his heart at that point? You know, I believe in you, Jesus. Maybe it was Pentecost when the Spirit filled him with, with great power. And, and a message so that it could stand in front of thousands of people and say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, and you will be saved. So, at what point did Peter go from a Jewish fisherman to a Christian? Because as soon as you start to kind of pin it down, you realize, wait, there's, there's another story here. Yeah, he had a great moment of, of faith as he walked out on the water, but he also fell through the ice, right? I mean, he's sinking down. He would have went to the bottom had not Jesus picked him up and said, no, where's your faith? And carrying him like a baby back to the boat, you know. And 
And in that moment of, of confirmation, you are the Christ. It wasn't much longer Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. And as Peter sees the glory of Jesus and just wants to stay, it wasn't much longer before he couldn't even remember his name. I don't know the man. Even after Easter and Pentecost, Spirit fills the Holy Spirit fills him and he's preaching. Peter still does not believe absolutely every word of Jesus that in fact he has come for all people. No, Peter draws back against the, the Gentiles and they have, to, they have to be different than what they are. See, it's not that easy, is it, to kind of nail this down. But here, here's an easier question, of course. When did Peter become a follower of Jesus? Now that one we know. We got, we got the text right there. The, the day he left his nets. See, what we learn about Peter, about following Jesus and believing Jesus, is that all kinds of messed up people followed Jesus. All kinds of people who would have faith in one moment and unbelief in another. All kinds of sinful people followed Jesus. In fact, so many of them that the good people would turn their nose down at Jesus. Like, well, he's a friend of sinners. That's the only kind of followers there were of Jesus. And as soon as you think that you're not somebody who's all kinds of messed up on the inside and the way you think and act and behave... The moment you think that, well, I believe Jesus all the time, in every last word and in every situation, and, and I'm not that big a sinner anymore, then look to see who's leading you because it's not Jesus anymore. You have a, you have a different leader at that point. It's probably yourself. And so we, we may not really know, you know, how all this conversion happens but we know what it is to follow Jesus. So, so how then in following Jesus do you get this faith? Well, that too we know. That's very plain in scriptures. After this big invitation to come follow is here's a gift. God himself is the one who gives the gift of faith to every person. Going from whatever you were to what you are now. In Jesus. You don't choose him. He chooses you. And God isn't arbitrary in his choices. He's not like choosing some people and not choosing other people. But his gift is for absolutely everybody. No exemptions, no exceptions. Everybody. In fact, you're wondering, well, well how, do I, how do I get this gift? And you don't have to go up to heaven to bring Jesus down or, or go down in the depths to bring him up. But he it's here, in the speaking of my words. Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message of Christ. It is here, the gift for you in the hearing and the receiving. But of course, it's, it's not magic either. You know, that's what Simon the sorcerer considered as he looked around and he saw what was going on when Peter and John placed their hands on the believers there in Samaria. As he considered, you know, how this gift of the Spirit was given by, by laying the hands and, and saying these words, he thought in his heart that, that somehow there, that it's that I could possess this power, I could control this power, and then won't I be truly great? Hey, he's willing to pay for this. He knows there's nothing for free in this world. I, I will sell everything to have this power. And Peter's rebuke was very stern and quick. You need to pray to God that your heart changes. You are so far from him right now. Pray for me then that this doesn't happen. Well, Peter was very clear and adamant that this is so wrong. I'm wondering if there isn't some kind of the, the Simon assumption in all of us. That somehow, that faith comes to a person by, by getting them to say certain words, like, Jesus is Lord. By getting them to confess certain doctrines and teachings that we kind of like. You know, once, you know, Vicar spent the last hour talking with people, and these are, the, these are the doctrines we like here. Now, if you can say these, okay, then you're in. 
You know, and, and I'm wondering if, if, if the whole Christian church hasn't kind of bought into this. We're just looking for the, the, the right method and the right technique that if we just do it this way, that somehow, like magic, this will now convert a person into a Christian. Now, most of us probably aren't looking for that best technique or if we just find those, those right words most of us have kind of flipped to the other side and realizing, yeah, that's how it works, and I don't have it. I'm not like Simon. I, I, I'm not even looking for it because, well, I, I don't know all those technical teachings of the church. I, I couldn't argue somebody into baptism, or I couldn't really talk with any, uh, uh, somebody that knows a lot of another religion. And Yeah, so you know what? I'm just going to leave it for someone else, somebody who knows what they're doing. In fact, I'll just, you don't have to raise your hand, but it's kind of fun if you do. Take a poll here. Who feels absolutely confident in their ability to share their faith and that in sharing their faith, it's going to have some results? Anybody in this room? One, two, three, four. Okay, so the rest of us, my hand didn't go up. I was just doing the example hand. All right. I do not feel completely uh, confident that I could, you know, stand and have this great reason to believe to an atheist or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sikh or some other kind of religion. In fact, I'm not even that confident in sharing my faith with my next door neighbor who just doesn't want to come to church but isn't any of those things. Anybody want to raise their hand on that one? Okay. And, and so here we are that, you know, we, we kind of, Kind of looking for that, that really cool way to do it if we just knew it, if we just had all the answers. But even if you had this really great heart-wrenching story about how God saved you out of this horrible sinful life that you had, and it's just so emotional, you just, you loved telling it because when people hear it, things happen. I don't have that story. I don't have great kind of arguments that could, could really convince an atheist. But you know, when you look at the scriptures from beginning to end, there were no magical words that were to be used every time. There were no techniques that, okay, now do it this way. In fact, how did God bring faith to the very first people, Adam and Eve, after they had taken the fruit? How did God give them faith? Do you remember the words? It was pretty simple. I'm going to send you a baby. I'm going to send humanity a child who will grow up. His heel's going to get bruised, but he's going to crush the head of the serpent. Adam and Eve heard this promise, and they were renewed in their faith. Well, how, how did God give faith to Noah? Did he say those words again? No. He told Noah, Noah, I'm going to flood the earth. I want you to build a boat. I'm going to save you and your family. Guess what Noah did? He believed God. Build a boat, save the earth and the animals. His family. How did God give faith to Abraham? Did he use these words or same techniques? No, he showed up to Abraham and said, Abraham, look up. Okay, I'm looking up, Lord. See all those stars? I see them. Okay, Abraham, I'm going to give you such a big family, more stars than the sky. Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. You got a God, Abraham. Abraham believed. Well, how did God then give faith to people that had no idea who he was or even wanted to be with him? You know, God even uses, I know this is going to shock you, he even uses hate speech. I know. Weird. I don't think it's his preferred method, but he certainly used it in the case of, of uh, Jonah, right? Jonah hated those people. Listen to his sermon. Forty more days, you're going to be destroyed. I'm done here. <laughs> Did the people of Nineveh believe God? Were they saved? Did the town get destroyed? No. How did God give faith to, to David in any of these ways? But he came to him and said, I'm your shepherd. I'm going to put one of your family members on a throne forever. 
And David, shepherd boy, would write, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not be in want. And he makes me to lie down, and he leads me beside still waters. Jump to the New Testament. How did God give faith to a, a young woman in Nazareth? But he sent an angel, and he said, Mary, you're so blessed. You're going to have a baby who is the rescuer I promised to Adam and Eve. You're going to have a baby who sits on King David's throne, just like I promised. You're going to have a baby like no other baby, and then there's not going to be a guy involved. It's the Holy Spirit because it's my son, and he will save the entire world, humanity, from their sins. And what did Mary say? Let it be to me as you have said. But what did, what did he do to bring faith to Joseph? He didn't say, hey, Mary's going to have this baby. But he said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph woke up from a dream and believed God. God can use one word. If it were a magical word, I'd have you write it down, memorize it, and use it on everyone. But that's not how it works. One word creates all the faith. And, and, and you know the story. Mary Magdalene was at the tomb of Jesus. She's crying and weeping. Jesus is dead. She has no faith in a living Savior until one word. Say it with me. Mary. <gasps> Teacher! Faith! Thomas! Doubting Thomas, you remember him? He just gives him one of these things. Here, come and touch me. Paul knocks him off his horse. I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Talk about your hater. There's not a bigger hater on the earth of the Christian faith than Paul. And now there wasn't a bigger writer about faith that filled the pages of the New Testament about faith. And finally, at the very last book of the Bible, John, the beloved disciple, at the end of his life, he, are we going to be okay, Jesus? Are, are we going to make it? And he says, I am coming again. In all these different stories from the beginning to the end, what is the one thing that ties them all together but God himself? He used various peoples and angels or himself. He used haters and lovers to proclaim one thing. Come and follow me. Come and be mine. I want you. You see, God, from the moment of your waters of baptism and the words spoken over you, from that moment until, until the very present, God has been gathering people, giving them faith in following Jesus. And as we follow, as we consider all that he's done, we realize that, well, he can use any words. Don't you see, it, it's not a magical word. It's your word about him. See, you can do this. You can speak of Jesus lovingly and in your own way. You can speak of Jesus in such a way that you don't have to worry about convincing or arguing somebody. You're just talking about God, the triune God, and He uses those words as He has always used them in such a way that faith is born. But it, it won't happen unless we repent. You and me, and me. We repent of our Simon ways of thinking, well, there has to be just the, the correct technique and the correct words. To repent of the Simon ways of magical words and believe that God will use your words, whatever they are, about Him. We repent of our, of our looking for instant and magical results once we have shared these words of Jesus. Well, I talked about Jesus and they didn't come to faith. Where's the magic in that? We repent of that demand for an instant magical response and we believe that God's word goes out and does not return void or empty. 
And in the meantime, we comfort ourselves with the words of Jesus that these words that we share, they're, they're like seeds being cast by a farmer. And sometimes people are just not ready. In fact, most people are not ready. Their hearts are hard like cement or asphalt. It's just, it's stone. It cannot go in. And the birds come and they take it away. And some people are just so caught up in the, the joys and the pleasures of this world that they may rejoice for a time, but when hardship comes and persecution because of the word, it, it chokes it out. But some people, some people, their, their hearts are ready. God has prepared their hearts. And as you share this seed, it takes its place in the soil. And all by itself, it begins to grow. It's just tiny. It's tiny at first, but then it grows so big and so amazing. We believe these words. We trust in our God from our baptism until now, this very moment when our feet are beautiful because we're going out and we're sharing good news that Jesus is the one inviting you to come and follow. Amen.